have the best likelihood of outperforming. Just to put it in context, today what we're discussing pertains to the universe of open-ended equity funds. So, Firoz, thanks very much for joining me for this episode. But there are more than 450 uh, mutual fund schemes that fall into this open-ended category. From there, how do you actually manage to bring it down to a portfolio, which would be, what, 8 or 10 schemes? Correct. I think, I think uh, there are separate uh, filters. So you percolate all these 457 funds uh, through degrees of filters, and then what you're left with is a fewer schemes. Then you apply principles of finance to come to weightages. So it's a, it's a three, four step process to narrow down from a number of schemes to a fewer schemes. Then you apply other scientific methods to actually arrive at weights because the same schemes can in different weights can throw up different portfolio performances. Yeah. So these, these steps actually help you narrow it down. Okay, so I went through, uh, you know, uh, your presentation on this and uh, you have given 50% weightage to historical data. Now, within historical data, what's the data that investors should actually be looking at? See, firstly, it's important to spend, a, spend 30 seconds on historical data is 50% weight. 50% uh, weight has to be given to something which is non-historical, which mm. is future-based, yeah. uh, which is what I think is very, very critical. We always try and only look at the rear view mirror mm. and not look at the windsheet uh, to drive. And mm. that actually creates a, a, a larger probability of an accident mm. or an expectation and a delivery has a mismatch. So point one, 50% weight to historical automatically implies that there's 50% to future. Yeah. Now, very importantly, what are those uh, weights uh, to be given in the historical uh, perspective is to, one, important is return. Uh, when returns are being measured, there are two ways to measure it. One is the trailing return. Mm. Now, if I see the trailing return today for three years, that means that it's the exact three years uh, from uh, 16th mm. of September, uh, backwards three years. But that's just one data point. If you took rolling returns, you will get several data mm. points. 15 September 2019 backwards to 15 September 2016. Yeah. And 14 September to 14 September. So that's called a rolling return. So firstly, if you're using returns, please use rolling returns. So we give mm -hmm. emphasis to rolling returns. And 20% of the weight uh, out of the 50 uh, mm -hmm. is given to rolling returns. Okay, and uh, it's not just that, right? You also look at uh, giving some weightage to risk, to alpha. Uh, why is that important for an investor? See, uh, very importantly, uh, there are two sides of the coin. One is risk and return. And the third important thing to look at from a past performance or past performance perspective is how much did the fund manager outbeat the benchmark? You're paying a fee to a person not buying an exchange traded fund or an index fund mm. uh, so that he beats it. So these are the three variables. One is return, but using the right measure, not trailing measure, rolling measure will give you several data points of three year investor returns. Uh, second is risk. Now the second side of the coin, which is risk is very, very critical. Uh, risk is measured in standard deviation and standard lower the standard deviation the better is the fund from a risk uh, perspective uh, so so now uh, if i look at a fund large cap funds have a risk measure in the range of 14 to 15 Mm. Mid-cap funds have 18 to 19. Small-cap funds sometimes can range between 20 and 22. So 14, 18, and 20 are the benchmarks for large, mid, and small-cap. Now, very important for us to understand what is Nifty's risk measure. Quite a few traders, forget investors, mm. don't look at risk even on Nifty. And they've mm. been trading on Nifty for several years. I think that doesn't make sense. So Nifty return uh, risk for the last three years is about 12.89 to be precise. So it gives you a perspective in terms of a context mm. to read the numbers which mm. I just uh, mentioned. Okay, and I noticed when I asked you about historical data, you very vehemently said that, you know, futuristic uh, analysis is also very, very important. So that also has 50% weightage in your selection process, right? Now, within future analysis, what can we monitor? Uh, we can monitor several things. Actually, uh, people give up saying that future is something which we can't analyze because it's still yeah, to come. Exactly. Uh, but statistics has measures to anticipate the future, not yeah. precisely, but better than just looking at the past performance. So the first thing which is very important is uh, to see the portfolio created by the fund manager mm -hmm. is bought because he is he or she as a fund manager is trying to pick up businesses which are going to grow faster mm -hmm. than their peers or competitors so there is a measure called price to earnings 
divided by growth. That's called peg ratio. Hmm. Okay, I'll explain it to you. Per unit of growth uh, expected, how much is the P valuation you're paying for it? Hmm. You're paying a value to a stock because it's going to grow. Hmm. What is the growth expectation? Let's assume you're paying 15 price to earning for a stock, which is expected to grow at 15% per annum, then the ratio, peg ratio is 1. So peg ratio helps you understand the value you're paying for the growth you're anticipating in that business. So a reasonable portion of weightage is given to peg ratio. Uh, the second very important thing is to find the fund manager and his decision-making capability. Mm. Uh, so if you analyze these 140-odd fund managers who are managing these 457 funds, uh, you will be able to see which other fund managers by design are taking more right decisions than wrong decisions. That's one more thing you put weightage to. And then then you'll also look at other futuristic parameters which helps you uh, assign weightages of 50% there. Okay, so you know Feroz, now uh, uh, we've known you what, for 10 years and I know you've always liked to take the scientific approach, the data approach to any sort of financial or investment uh, decision. But is there any scope for a qualitative uh, assessment as well when you're selecting the funds? Yes, there's a large scope for uh, uh, qualitative parameters as well, subjective parameters. Uh, doing analysis on how st how stable is the fund management team, doing an audit on the AMC practices and processes uh, are also very, very critical. Understanding the depth of the analyst team, which will not be numerically measured, uh, not just in number, in terms of their capability, understanding the stability of the fund manager, AMC's process uh, implementation, uh, making sure that there's no one man actually running the shop then you're taking risk of that person not being in the same com company so subjective is the next degree of uh, test you have to uh, you have to put uh, all the schemes to uh, and then make a choice all right so once you have the math in place and you've shortlisted some uh, schemes then you put them to the qualitative uh, test and let the human actually figure out if there are any flaws to that. Okay, what we'll do now is take a very quick break. We've discussed about how you can shortlist some mutual fund schemes, but when we return, Feroz is going to tell us how to use the scheme evaluation criteria to actually construct an optimum serving portfolio. Stay tuned. Welcome back. So far on MF Corner, we've spoken about how to handpick those mutual fund schemes with a higher likelihood of being the outperformers of the future. But that doesn't mean your job is done. Now, 
we'll learn how best to use these funds in combination with each other to actually create a superior portfolio. So, Firoz, we've discussed the fund selection, but uh, does it mean that every scheme that you select or you shortlist has an equal weight in the portfolio? I mean, does it matter how much money you put to each? Yes, I think, uh, Sumera, this question is very valid and gets missed out in most people's mutual fund selection uh, process. Now, if you and me are given the same eight schemes and asked to assign weightages and put money, the performance of your portfolio and mine is going to be dramatically different. So it's very important to use science to arrive at the most optimal weights than just use your own perceptions and subjectivity when making these allocations. Uh, fortunately, since finance is one of the most well-researched subjects, uh, there are uh, tools available. Markowitz is one of the most popular tools uh, to create a portfolio from the schemes and not just uh, leave it to judgment. Markowitz is a Nobel Prize one formula which helps you assign weights uh, to different chosen schemes uh, such that the risk is mitigated and you have the most efficient possible return for that given level of risk. Now, if I draw up an analogy, uh, if, you're, if, you're, if you will probably with a pizza, a sauce goes better than a mint chutney, right? Mm -hmm. uh, of course, the analogy is uh, something which is uh, no, very dramatic. Point, yeah. uh, so it's also very important to find out which schemes goes better with another. Right? They're not mutually exclusive. A Mirai will fit with the Reliance better than a Birla may be. Right? Because there would be intersection between their portfolios. There will be negative and positive correlations which need to be factored in. And that, Markowitz as a theory, uses 20,000 portfolios to see which was the most efficient. Uh, so that's what we do and then comes the weightages uh, on those eight schemes and then you know uh, that there's been science applied, historical and future both to choose those schemes and then not left it there and cross the rest of the bridge by actually applying science to come to the allocation as well. Otherwise, most advisors just put arbitrary numbers, 20 year, 30 year, 10 year, but uh, Markowitz tells you precisely what second decimal allocations should be. Okay, so basically there might be more than just eight good funds in the market, but these are the eight which work best in combination with each other. So not to say that, you know, every other fund is bad, but you have to find the combination that works for you. You know, now it makes perfect sense why, uh, you know, you've chosen and advocated the style of having a model portfolio with a select number of funds. And, you know, some of the AMCs also which you have chosen in your model portfolio, I mean, according to me, I thought you chose it ahead of the curve. So was there any indicator that led you to choose that AMC? And why have you stuck with the funds? You, I mean, I haven't noticed you change your funds very often. Yes, well, I think these are very, very valid observations. Uh, point one, uh, if you have looked at the future, uh, in, in whatever uh, tools you are you, which are available to you, automatically, uh, if you've been futuristic, you're not chasing your own tail. So you will not have to make changes at that frequency if you've just looked at the rearview mirror. Because if you've just looked at the past performing best scheme, it might just be that it's a fag end of its rally because all the stocks have already been juiced out and their potential has been realized. So one reason why there'll be lesser change is because you've looked at future. And the second is, you're using a uh, couple of other very, very important tools in the future measurement, uh, like a target NAV. See, when we recommend stocks to people, if at all we do, the next obvious question is, what's the target price? But when it comes to mutual funds, which is nothing but a basket of stocks, mm -hmm. nobody ends up asking you this question, what is the weighted average target price for this basket? Mm -hmm. This question, if it is relevant for a stock, how is it not relevant to a basket of stocks? So we actually go ahead and compute each stock's target price and then multiply it into the weights in that scheme to arrive at a target NAV. So if you're at 100 rupees and the target NAV is 130, that means that there's a headroom of 30%. So if you have two schemes, one with 20% headroom and another with 30% headroom, uh, all else equal, I will choose the one which has a larger headroom for a between a target NAV and the current NAV. So when you do that, then you automatically are anticipating future in all the four corners. Uh, so you will not have to change, make changes in the future. Uh, so that's, that's one reason why there's been consistency. And you're you're not just being reactive, you're being proactive, choosing some asset management companies which nobody has bought yet. And I think uh, regression is what this subject is also called. Uh, no, that, that makes perfect sense actually because it also negates the need for future churn because you've already done 
your homework. Uh, now, the one question that a lot of people want to know is that, you know, so far when we experts have spoken about creating a portfolio selecting schemes, they say, look at your risk profile, uh, risk appetite, uh, you know, look at your age, etc., how much money you want to invest, so on and so forth. If you, the, if the call is to make a model portfolio and stick to it, how does that, uh, 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 you know, help people with different risk profiles? I mean, how can it be the same for everyone? See, uh, risk profiles. Now, let's assume you have a lesser appetite for risk and I have more appetite for risk. You will put, let's assume, 40% of your money in equity mutual funds. I'll put 80%. Risk is always managed by asset allocation. Schemes for you and me should be identical. Because if as an Anandrati private wealth management outfit, if I just uh, told you my difficulty, if I created 5,000 different HNI portfolios, it is humanly impossible uh, for me to track all the 5,000 in the same rigor I can, f I can track one. So you will bring in so much more depth in your analysis if all of us follow the same portfolio, but uh, with different proportions as a percentage of your overall wealth. If you have 100 rupees, you put 40, I have 100, I put 80, and that changes our risk provided dramatically. So when, when I speak of those eight schemes which I buy for my clients and myself, I exactly know there are 232 fund stocks in that portfolio, which ones did badly last month, which ones did better, what are the changes which happened. You can be on top of one portfolio and adjust the risk using asset okay, allocation. So That's worked better yeah. for us. So tracking a limited universe uh, yields better returns naturally than tracking everything. But now what investors want to know, Feroz, is you know, you've mentioned things like standard deviation, peg ratio, target, any of where do they access this information or are they left to compute it for themselves? See, uh, to my mind, I think uh, this, I have a 22 member team doing this for a living. Uh, so, so probably uh, on one of our shows, they can get the advice, which is an output of this. Uh, for somebody to believe the output, it's also very important to understand the process. You don't have to do the process yourself. Fortunately, uh, we have electronic medium, like the mutual fund corner, does all this analysis and throws up the recommendations for free for a person. So I think that's what I would do if I was on the other side of the screen uh, looking at it. Okay, so basically the idea is that don't just uh, take it at face value when someone recommends a scheme to you or a portfolio to you. You also need to do your homework and question as to why that particular portfolio was constructed or why those schemes were chosen and therefore, uh, uh, you know, see if your advisor is giving you good advice. Firoz, thanks so much for actually breaking down this methodology Thank for you, us and we really wish that a lot more industry experts would actually take this initiative to explain to viewers what they need to do. Thanks very much, Thank Firoz. you so much. All right, so uh, before we wrap up, just a quick read through on what are the key takeaways for investors. One, of course, is that you need to approach mutual fund selection through an objective, data-driven approach, as has been explained by Feroz. Two, when you're looking at past returns, it's important that you look at rolling returns, which will actually help you analyze a scheme's performance across all the time frames and not distort the picture for investors. Also, besides past performance and the fund manager capabilities, which all of us normally do, you should also look at, you know, the risk of the fund, the alpha, the valuation, and like Firoz mentioned, a target NAV or the future return potential of that scheme. And finally, you need to keep in mind that risk and returns of each mutual uh, fund scheme are different. Once these are stitched together into a portfolio, the overall risk and returns will change. So make sure that you monitor risk on your overall portfolio and not just on your individual schemes. With that, we'll wrap up on MF Corner and we hope that you found this information useful. Thanks for watching.